Okay, we're ready to go. So I'm, um, I'm really mostly here to give Kim a little break because obviously she's the, uh, she's the expert on imaging and everything. But then also we felt that giving you a slightly different perspective on certain topics that are more relevant um, to, uh, to the insect world out there are, let's put it that way, small um, 3D specimens really. It's not only insects, obviously. Um, just to give you a slightly different perspective on some of the things. I'm not going to be going into the great detail that Kim has been giving you in many cases. So mine is just a much more general um, outline on providing examples of what we're doing, what we're using in the lab really mostly. And I'm not saying that's the right thing in many cases because, you know, we all go along and learn really. So obviously the uh, botanical garden has a lot more experience really in standardized imaging than many of us out there in the insect world have at this point. Okay, so I'm mostly going to be talking about pinned insects, um, not very much about slides because I felt that what we covered yesterday in that little video for general databasing purposes of slide collections, the InvertNet I think has the right idea. I will show some other options where we're more interested in research level um, documentation of specimens and where we're us using different approaches really. Okay, just to go back to the task cluster workflow, now obviously we're thinking specimen image capture and this is where I'm going to be mostly focusing um, my next half an hour or so. But then also there's a few things I want to mention with respect to image processing and then also output of images, some ideas on how you can you know, publicize the images you've been taking, like really low cost um, things that people in the entomological community have been using really. Okay, so that means um, there's going to be three sections, imaging of specimens, a few things on image manipulation, and again, it's very specific for some of the 3D um, considerations that might be small and 3D considerations that might not be import as important for the, um, for the botanical world, and then um, image display. Okay, so the first thing you really always want to consider, and Kim said as well, you really have to think of the purpose of that image. So if the image is really going to serve as an electronic specimen voucher, then you can do one thing, you can work with low, lower key equipment and everything to you know, reach your goals essentially. Or if you're really interested in documentation for research purposes, then obviously the cost can, can go up very, very high very quickly. And then obviously the purpose of the image will really determine the hardware selection um, and I will show you some of the examples that I've been working with really. Um, and then um, one thing I'm not really going to be mentioning later on but I'm sure Kim will also go through um, things like that in, in more detail too is what we've learned in a lab is extremely important is to come up with very clear, very precise imaging protocols. If you have a group of students or a group of graduate students, postdocs, including myself, everyone doing imaging, we don't really do that on an everyday basis. So we have these little bursts of imaging um, here and there, especially true for the, for the researchers, the grad students, the postdocs and me. So really having very clear protocols and having posted right next to your imaging, um, the table or the desk where you're doing your imaging, that's a really good thing to do because otherwise your image quality is going to vary really throughout time. And obviously, especially for publication purposes, mm -hmm. You want to put together a plate of something, a photo plate of something, and all images should have exactly the same standard and quality. Okay, um, so electronic spe specimen voucher or research specimen, and here is another example. So if I'm interested in capturing microscopic slides, you do it the way the um, InvertNet people are doing it, where you scan with a um, photo scanner or just a normal scanner essentially an entire you know, set of 20 slides at a time. This is sort of roughly what you're getting. So you can read the label really quite clearly. So transcribing the label data, that's going to be great, fantastic. But obviously as you see here, there's you know, multiple little brown dots on the slides. So even just for you to go back to reconfirm an identification that in this case is Guapinano spirigi, you really can't do that based on that image. So in order for a uh, taxonomist or someone working on that group really to go back and confirm that what's on that slide is really that species, 
you would have to still loan out the microscopic slide or you as a researcher will have to go to the institution to take another look at it. In this case, it's maybe not quite as critical because there's a holotype specimen and it's actually been really well documented in the original publication. So in this case, we would not maybe be quite as concerned about it. Then we're having what I call sort of in between. So it's not just a voucher or um, uh, the basis for data digitization, but it's a little bit higher quality, but it's still not quite there for research purposes. And this is what we're doing a lot in the lab too, for just routine documentation of specimens really. And this is what you see here. So again, um, we're talking really tiny insects. A lot of the images I'm going to be showing you, the specimens are about one millimeter. So this is 0.2 millimeters up here. Uh, this is actually, no, this is 0.5 millimeters. So this is a little bit bigger, but they're all really, really super tiny things. So in many cases, what we would do is just one dorsal habitus shot of something like that, just for documentation purposes. If you want to get a little bit closer to actual research, you know, research interest, in a case like that, you would want a dorsal habitus image, a lateral habitus image, and a ventral image as well, because there's very important taxonomic characters on the lateral side of the specimen, as well as on the ventral side. So things become longer, more complicated, takes more time, takes more effort to manipulate the specimen, things like that. And then this is sort of the, the ultimate research type approach where this actually shows exactly this specimen up here where I took these little overview pictures with a really cheap, not cheap, but you know, point shoot camera really. And then I used a much higher end imaging system to get these very detailed shots of individual body parts of that specimen. And you can see here one of the problems we're confronted with in entomology, what people do when they work with these really tiny insects, they don't mount them on a microscopic slide in one piece because they would be too high, you couldn't really see all the taxonomic features that are important. But what you do is you rip them apart. So in this case, you have the head and part of the thorax, then you have the wing separately, and then you have the two parts of the abdomen, and the dorsal and the ventral side, and they're all torn apart. So obviously for stuff like that, you have to, someone has to make the decision which are the important body parts that need to be imaged for something like that. So it's um, complicated stuff. Okay, um, just to summarize this, microscopic slides, data capture for locality info, this is perfectly fine. It's fast, obviously, you can scan 20 slides at a time. And then data capture for reach research requires, um, that requires more than just the occurrence data, is obviously much slower. Um, it's only feasible really for targeted projects or important specimens. And it is a lot more costly too, because obviously you have to invest in much higher end imaging equipment. Okay, um, so what I was saying is, you know, keep in mind the, the purposes of what you're doing. Um, occurrence info only, habitus overview can be good for a lot of things, or then research quality imaging with multiple views and detail shots of, you know, genitalic features are very important in insects, so you might need um, individual shots of genitalia, for example. Okay, imaging um, equipment, it ranges all the way from point shoot cameras. Um, they work quite well, I think, for certain things. Then the DSRL cameras, um, Kim was talking about as well. Typically, Nikon and Canon are sort of the sort of high-end, very frequently used cameras in, in insects, really. And again, think of you know, insects being relatively small, so we're, we have to adjust our, um, our imaging, um, um, imaging hardware for that as well. And then what most people um, are using by now are actually dedicated imaging systems. And they're obviously, they're really high end. They're, they're really, they're breathtakingly expensive, unfortunately. So Leica is a very, has very famous imaging systems. Um, and then in uh, North America and by now all across Europe and Australia, these visionary digital systems have become very, very popular. And I'm going to be showing you examples of those. Okay, so this is what I do when I go to a museum and I just want to briefly go through small specimens again and uh, take images so when I come back home I can remember what things look like, for example. But this is also something you could do for, you know, for, for relatively simple applications. So what I'm doing here is I have an insect drawer, I have the specimens, they are, they are point mounted. In this case, you can't really see that the point is actually down here in sort of grayish coloration. And I just put a specimen on a piece of styrofoam. 
underneath the microscope and then take my Nikon Coolpix camera and it involves a little bit of fiddling really. <laughs> so you have to go back and forth between macro setting and non-macro setting and then you just shoot your picture through the, um, um, through the ocular essentially. This is why what you see here, this is the, the actual ocular I, I shot through. Obviously one of the big drawbacks, again, this is a tiny specimen, this is one millimeter, so this was already really high uh, magnification, and then I cropped that out of this picture and blew it up, what you can see. When you use that for higher magnification, it becomes really blurry, so it's not very good quality. But again, keep in mind this is a really tiny specimen. If you do that for, for bigger things, the quality is much better. And then also the other problem is that you know, this specimen is quite flat, which is true for you know, a lot of the two-dimensional imaging we've seen in the, uh, in the plant world, really. But unfortunately, a lot of insects are not quite as flat. So what you start seeing here, this is part of the thorax, up here is the head, and things are curving down. So if you shoot through a microscope like that, you're not going to be getting you know, anything else but one plane into focus. So obviously, field of depth is really, really horrible for something like that. So, might work for certain things, not for standard, standard approaches. So, um, when I was visiting uh, Charles University in Prague last fall, um, this is the system I was using. So, it was a Canon, uh, uh, Canon SLR um, LR camera. Um, I can't actually remember the make, and I think I forgot. I wrote it down somewhere, but I didn't have it with me electronically, so I can't tell you exactly what it is. But along the line of the, um, the cameras um, Kim has been talking about before, and um, it has a nice macro objective attached to it. It was a <coughs> Canon camera. Um, and then their lighting system is fairly simple. So they just took two, you know, two normal, essentially desktop lamps, and they put them to either side of the, um, of the camera and it's mounted on a, essentially a microscope stand. So there's a lot of you know, customizing that happened really and putting that, putting that system together. Then in order to shoot the images, they just used the software that came with the Canon, Canon really um, to transfer the images to the computer and then manipulate them there further. So that actually um, worked really quite well. So what they're using is the stands where they put the uh, pinned insects into is just little pieces of styrofoam. And um, sometimes you could put your insect specimen, for example, so halfway into a unit tray, so you're diffusing the light outside a little bit, and you have this really quite bright surroundings, and then a pinned insect is sort of in the middle, so the light becomes really quite nicely spread out um, across the object, uh, uh, the object you're trying to image. So um, that worked really quite well for specimens um, down to about two millimeters. Once I got below that, that camera really wasn't quite up to the standard. So I came <coughs> home with a number of decent images, but also a number of images that I really wasn't quite happy with. Again, if you're shooting, mostly shooting bigger specimens, and this is what that camera is really for, so most of the people in that department work on, on you know, bigger moths and, and things that, you know, they're a decent, decent size. For stuff like that, this camera is really great. Okay. So I was mentioning the, um, um, the integrated imaging systems, really Visionary Digital. It's the company changed its name a few times throughout um, history. So it's been out there for, I'd say, 15 years probably. Um, they're dedicated, customized imaging systems, really. They come typically with, by now, um, actually, uh, yeah, well, you can't really see that well, but um, a, either a Canon or a Nikon camera. So the camera we're using at the moment is a, Canon EOS 70D that works really quite well. When I purchased that system in 2007, the cameras were extremely expensive and they didn't come with a live view option at that point, so you needed an extra little camera because you wanted to be able to focus and adjust your image looking at a computer screen really. <laughs> And those little cameras were a complete pain. So I'm very happy that by now, a lot of the higher end cameras do have that live view option. And it was very important for us to look into that very uh, closely when we purchased our new camera. And the image you see on the computer screen now with the Canon EOS software is really, is really quite good and good enough to manipulate the image. Okay, what's really special about this system is it comes with um, integrated lighting system. 
So what you see here, this big box, this is a flash, and this is the most powerful and also unfortunately the most noisy flash I've ever encountered in my life. At the American Museum, for a little while, they had three of these systems sitting in one imaging room. And when people sit there and take images all day, and I was two offices down the hall from that room, you would hear the ba-chunk, ba-chunk, ba-chunk for the entire day. It was, it was really annoying. So they've given up on that imaging room idea and they moved two of the systems out to other places, which I'm sure makes the neighboring people very happy. So it's an extremely powerful flash that steered through the, uh, the camera, essentially. So that's the one really cool thing about its system. The other thing is a so-called infinity lens, and this is a lens that really helps incredibly with the depth of field of that system, such that the, uh, um, the, the owner and the person who is promoting that system argues that he would never touch, or he personally wouldn't touch any of the stacking software that a lot of us are using for the you know, higher three-dimensional specimens, just because he feels the depth of field of that system is so good that you don't really have to worry about that kind of image manipulation, which obviously, if you do a lot of imaging, this is a great thing because you're not wasting time on playing with the images.